I've always wanted to fly supersonic, and when I was a kid, there was only one way to do that. The Anglo-French Concorde airliner is making a first run under its own power. Concorde was just this engineering marvel, travelling faster than the speed of sound. But before I could fly on one... This was the scene after July's Concorde crash. A Concorde flight crashed shortly after takeoff, killing 113 people. And soon after, the plane stopped flying for good. Commercial supersonic flight went away. But now some are trying to bring it back. We're starting off with what we call Overture, which is a big leap forward from Concorde. If they succeed, they could once again revolutionize how we fly. Supersonic flight over land really expands uh, the market potential. But that success could hang on one sound, the sonic boom. The question is, can you make that go away? So is supersonic flight coming back? Well, that's why I'm at this air museum in England, because if you want to know how to get supersonic to succeed, you need to know what killed off Concorde. So to find out, I'm finally gonna step foot on one. Let's go. So I think it's somewhere back here. Oh my God, it's there. <laughs> Look at it, it's incredible. This is Concorde 101. It's one of the very early prototype Concords, and it's displayed here at the stage that NASA, Lockheed, and Boom are at at the moment, that early development phase. Take a look at these names. They explain part of the reason why Concorde didn't last. At a cost of 100 million pounds, the development will be undertaken by the British Aircraft Corporation and Sud Aviation of France. Concorde wasn't born out of a company chasing a commercial demand for supersonic flight. It was created by two countries, France and the UK. It was created by government ministries, built by government factories, and uh, used by government airlines. That's Richard Abalafia, an aviation analyst at Teal Group. And the airlines he's talking about are Air France and British Airways, who bought Concorde from their governments for a fraction of the cost. Everybody involved cooperated in subsidizing Concorde. It was difficult to not go along with it because there was so much pride at stake. The planes flew principally from New York to London and Paris, with a one-way trip taking as little as three hours. And even though a round trip cost around $10,000 by 1999, passengers were still willing to pay for that speed. The operators, of course, saw it as a flagship. It's a great way of attracting premium passengers. Part of the reason those tickets were so expensive was that Concorde was just really expensive to run. Everybody involved, whether it was the builders or the operators, were losing money on Concorde. It was incredibly fuel thirsty and costly to operate and maintain. And then two events happened that would spell the beginning of the end of Concorde. The first, a crash in 2000, which killed 113 people and grounded the plane. And the second, 9-11, which saw a major decline in air traffic. Soon after that, Airbus announced they would no longer support the craft. And with passenger numbers never recovering for Concorde, in 2003, BA and Air France stopped flying. Finally stepping on board. Oh, wow. This thing's incredible. And I really wish I would have done this when I was a kid because I do not fit. I'm six foot five and it is very cramped in here. Let's go check out the cockpit. Now this goes to show just how much it took to keep Concorde in the air. But one of Concorde's biggest limiting factors happened before the plane ever carried passengers. There are a variety of, of reasons why I'm opposed to the Concorde under the present circumstances. Uh, one, primarily, uh, is the noise. See, Concorde's biggest selling point was that it could travel faster than the speed of sound. But when an object passes through that sound barrier, it can create a sonic boom. And they're not exactly quiet. We're not talking about average plane noise here. Sonic booms sound more like explosions. They can break windows. At the start of this year, a sonic boom from a jet shook the windows of my house. This is from a nearby doorbell camera. Needless to say, this annoys people and generally rules out the idea of supersonic flights over land. In 1973, the FAA brought into effect a regulation that prohibited civilian aircraft from flying faster than the speed of sound over US land. Other countries soon followed suit. This dramatically limited the routes that Concorde could effectively operate on to transoceanic ones. Now that same FAA regulation is still in effect today, but the FAA have said that they're considering policy and regulatory changes that could result in new noise certification standards for overland supersonic aircraft. Essentially, the change could mean that you could fly supersonic over land, and that would open up new routes and possibly change the economics of this, but only if your plane is quiet enough. But how do you make a plane that goes supersonic without going boom? 
Surely that defies the physics of this, right? Well, physics isn't my strong suit, but fortunately I have a colleague with her own YouTube channel on health and science, and you can subscribe to that here. Hey, Daniela. Hello. Hey, Daniela. We all say sonic boom, but what is it? What actually causes it? Sound is basically waves moving through the through the air. So when you have a sound, that those waves like basically bounce off those molecules until they hit your ear. That happens at a certain speed. So when something is moving through the air, like at the speed of sound or faster, those waves kind of build up. They build up in such a way that there's a lot of pressure. Right, so you're traveling at the same speed as those molecules and they have nowhere to go, right? Yeah, when the, the aircraft busts through that pressure buildup, you have the sonic boom. Got it, so the pressure is released all at once and that's what makes the sound. That's right. Okay, okay, so how on earth do you make that quieter? It comes down to the design of the aircraft. So you can find a way in which to minimize that pressure buildup or to dissipate it so that it cracks open over a longer period of time and then that will help minimize the amount of noise that you hear. To try and disperse that sonic boom, NASA and Lockheed have developed this, the X-59, a quiet supersonic demonstrator plane. First goal is to show that we can design an aircraft for a low sonic thump. And then the ultimate goal is to actually fly this aircraft over communities and establish their tolerance for that sonic thump. They're aiming for the craft to have a perceived loudness level, or PLDB, of 75. It's comparable to, say, your neighbor closing their car door across the street. For reference, the, the PLDB of Concord was on the order of 107. We're not completely eliminating the boom. We're just bringing it down to a level where it'll blend into people's everyday lives. For now, the X-59 can only fit one person, the pilot. And they can't even see forward through the window due to the design of the plane. But for NASA, the aim here isn't to create a commercial supersonic aircraft but instead fly their low sonic boom aircraft over neighborhoods and gauge how the public reacts. That information will then help the FAA reassess their regulations. Our ultimate goal is to provide them this dose response relationship information from our community testing in, in the hopes of, of changing regulations and, and allowing overland supersonic flight. Lockheed and NASA told me that they expect the FAA to make a decision on the noise limits for overland supersonic flight by 2035. If the FAA do change those regulations, there's at least one company that might take advantage of that. In June, United Airlines placed an order for 15 planes from Boom Supersonic, a Denver-based startup that launched in 2014 and has raised over $270 million from investors. There's this incredible appetite for how do we make high-speed flight available everywhere. That's their CEO, Blake Scholl. We are started focusing on transoceanic routes, but boy, that is just the start. Right now, Boom is still in the development phase and is working on their X-1B demonstrator. It's in ground test now. It's going to be on a runway around the end of the year, starting to fly next year. The company has hopes to start flying passengers in 2029 using its Overture 1 aircraft, which the company says will fly at Mach 1.7 using sustainable aviation fuels. It's likely that Overture 1 will still make a sonic boom. But Boom's CEO told me that he's monitoring the work that NASA and Lockheed are doing, and that future Boom aircraft will be optimised to hit any new target noise levels. There's a lot of innovation to be had in terms of improving the efficiency of the airplane and, uh, and yes, uh, also be able to do high-speed flight unrestricted everywhere. So if the FAA changes regulations, and if Boom's next generation of planes comply with those regulations, will it be enough for commercial supersonic flight to finally be economically sustainable? Well, some analysts think not. Because even if you can fly supersonic anywhere, you still need to be able to find passengers who can afford tickets. Just as in Concord's day, it's a question of finding enough people with enough money on enough routes, and that last part is key. Richard told me that he believes that market may be pretty small, but Boom say that they plan to try and lower operational costs to encourage lower ticket prices and attract a wider range of customers. We're focused on reducing the cost of operation and setting up the entire uh, ecosystem so that there are going to be economies of scale. So we're targeting you know, roughly a 75% reduction in cost per passenger. Even if Boom can achieve that, they still might not be able to fly everywhere, and that's due to fuel range. The obvious route, say the Pacific, uh, like New York to Tokyo, can't happen because these things really like to drink fuel. So that's not a valid route. It would have to stop in Alaska and Hawaii or something, and that would obviate any of the advantage associated with supersonic flight. And still, even if they can solve both of those issues, 
Richard thinks that there's still one thing that may stop commercial supersonic flight becoming mainstream, and that's things like this. See, back in Concorde's day, I couldn't stay connected while I was flying, and how long I was in the air for really mattered. But nowadays, I can just work on the plane. Why are you rushing to get somewhere? More importantly, why are you paying an awful lot more to get a much smaller space just to save a couple of hours where you'd be connected anyway? So will we see commercial supersonic flight in the skies once more? Well, it's likely that those planes may find a route to market as commercial business jets, where ticket pricing can be a little more elastic. But achieving the right design to open up new routes and lower those ticket prices and make these planes a common feature in our skies is going to be a huge challenge. And if companies exploring supersonic get it wrong, their aircraft may end up in a museum like this one. And my supersonic dreams will continue to be unfulfilled. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video. It really means a lot to me. So do you think you'll ever fly supersonic? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you're interested in the future of how we might be getting from A to B, then don't forget to subscribe. See you soon.